Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming here today. Um, I am Zulu Shi. I'm a lecturer at the um, education department here in Oxford, but closely associated to the OII and working with people here. Um, and uh, I'm hosting today's talk by Professor Carolyn Heinrich with the topic, When Technology Delivers all of the instruction in a classroom, immediate and long-term impacts for learners. So we're very looking forward to your talk today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just a short introduction um, to Professor Caroline Heinrich. Um, Caroline is a professor of public policy and education in the Department of Leadership Policy and Organizations of the Peabody College and a professor of economics in the College of Arts and Sciences. Her research focuses on education, workforce development, social welfare policy, program evaluation, and public management and performance management. So that, that's a lot mm -hmm. of <laughs> interesting research going on there. She works directly with federal, state, and local governments in her research to improve policy design and program effectiveness, and also collaborates with non-governmental organizations such as the World Bank, UNICEF, and others to improve the impact of economics and social investment in middle income and developing countries. Carolyn received the David Kershaw Award for Distinguished Contributions to the Field of Public Policy Analysis and Management in 2004, and was elected to the National Academy of Public Administration in 2011. So, um, Today's talk will be about 30 to 40 minutes. We'll then open up to the audience here and also online. Um, you can ask questions if you have comments. Um, just to be aware, I just want to mention that this is a recorded um, presentation, so uh, it will be available on the project's web, uh, on the department's website. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for attending, and um, I'm going to introduce the project, and I just, um, if there are questions and clarifications I go through, because I know I'm going to be talking about a U.S. context, and sometimes questions like that, I'm happy to answer them, but you know, bigger questions that we can engage in discussion would be good to reserve for later. So um, I've studied technology, uh, particularly for use in education of various types, and today I'm going to talk about one particular type of technology, and this is um, used for uh, online course taking. In the United States, we've seen a very rapid expansion of online course taking. I'll describe what that, what that means, and I'll show you some examples um, from, our, from our work. Um, so essentially, right now, about more than 75%, right? So more than three out of four school districts. And in the United States, we have school districts, which will have many different schools in them, oftentimes of different elementary, middle, and high school use some form of either blended or digital learning um, to help increase course offerings is one purpose, but it's also used um, very often to help students who fail a course retry to regain that credit. So probably like other systems, the US, ha the US has particular requirements for students in order to graduate from high school to complete their, their secondary education. And they're usually in specific areas, you know, math, science, language, arts that they think are important for students to take. So if a student fails that course and it's a required course in the graduate, they have to figure out a way to pass it in order to complete their high school education. And so one way is, uh, one of the challenges, of course, is if there are a lot of students failing a course here or there, then they have to go back into the classroom and take the class. It can crowd the class for the next group of students coming up. And so one alternative that has now been marketed and is now widely used is having the students take the course online, okay? And so this is the, the rates of course failure in our high schools varies a lot by, you know, where the high school is located, its socioeconomic context and things like that. In the particular school district where I'm presenting based on the research I'm presenting today, about 67%, that's two thirds of students failed at least one course, would have to repeat it, that they would have to repeat. Um, it's only been made worse by the pandemic. And the other thing is since, because of the pandemic we've seen, you know, more learning loss and course failures, we also saw that the vendors of these course, online course taking systems found that this is now a bigger market. 
And so many more school districts have even adopted it since that statistic that I uh, presented at the beginning. So I'm gonna specifically talk today about the use of the online course taking systems or what we call credit recovery, right? Recovering the credit that you failed. You have to try to, to get that credit in order to graduate. It's distinct from, you know, just using it to increase course offerings. So for example, um, if a student is in a school and it doesn't offer them an advanced computer science class, um, they might be, and that course is offered in the online course taking system, they could take it online versus, you know, because it's not available in their school. But that's actually a relatively small fraction of the use of these systems. It's mostly now for helping students um, recover the course credit. And so what we're looking at is these are actual courses fully developed by vendors. Um, and by vendors, I mean like a private uh, company. And all of the course content is delivered through the system. So the students will sit and, for example, watch an online uh, a video. And it's asynchronous, right? They're asynchronous instructional videos. There's not actual live interaction with the instructor. Um, and most of the assessments, um, so a student will watch a video, they'll get a multiple choice assessment. And then if they pass that, they can move on to the next module. And then if there's a unit, they might complete a unit test. And then if they complete all their tests with the minimum scores, they can then um, get recover the course credit. Students will get a login ID for this system. Um, and that allows them to complete specific courses. So the teachers typically know, you know, what courses the students are trying to complete to graduate. And what we've really seen, to, uh, seen is that the role of the classroom instructor is transformed. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what we saw. I'll tell you how many observations. We did hundreds of observations of, of the systems in use. Um, but if you can imagine, what happens is the typical setting, and we talk to people around the US and this is very typical. By the way, the course taking system we're studying is used in all 50 states in the US. Um, but anyway, so the students will come into a room and since you know what they're taking depends on what they failed, the instructor now may have students taking a range of subjects at different levels. And so oftentimes that instructor doesn't do much in the way of teaching per se or one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, they're most of the time trying to help the students get connected if they forgot their right password, um, you know, if they get stuck somewhere in the system or if they, you know, they, they might come over. But so it really transforms the role of the instructor. And of course, if the instructors were to try and provide um, kind of content support, they would need to have knowledge of the content, but that's not always the case. Um, okay, so what are some of the potential upsides of this? Um, one is that it offers the students option to take it anytime, anywhere. So it is the case that, you know, in that they're used within the schools, but if a student has his login ID and is at home and has a connection at home, they can continue to work at home, right? So we actually saw some students who were blended using the sessions because they were blending work with school. Um, the other advantage for students, so let's say you, you fail the course and you failed it because let's say you, you, um, lost interest in the end and you started, your performance was poor at the end of the course. So maybe you did well in some of the modules and you could pretest out of those modules of the course and then have less um, instruction to go through, right? Fewer instructional videos. So that's another possible advantage. And, and you know, different schools can use, decide how they wanna use that pretesting system, um, whether they allow students to do that, to take as pretest as much as possible out of them. But that's important to keep in mind because that means they can also move through the classes faster. Um, it also can provide real-time data that teachers can use to support the students. So ideally, you know, a, a teacher, even if they couldn't get to every student in the classroom, they could see, for example, on a local area network, they can see what's happening on the desktop. As they see a student stuck, they might proactively go over and say, hey, I see you've been not making progress for estimates. What is going on? How can I help you? What are you studying? We didn't see that happen very often. It was mm -hmm. a pretty rare uh, occurrence. Um, it also reduces the cost of credit recovery. So we've studied this with school districts to find out what they spend on these systems, what they spend on personnel to manage it um, and instructors. And we found that it, um, the major cost savings are because they put higher student to teacher ratios in a classroom, right? So you can pack students with computers in a room. And if the instructor isn't actually doing much in instruction, you know, pedagogically or, or working with students, 
you can put more students in there. So there were higher student to teacher ratios and also use of what we call paraprofessionals or teachers who aren't content licensed. Um, and so, um, and it's also been linked to substantial increases in high school graduation rates across the US. So one of the things that happened in the US is um, not that long ago, we, we sometimes shift performance standards. And one of the performance standards we started tracking at the federal level was graduation rates. And that right, those graduation rates can be tied to, for example, funding that comes, comes to districts. So districts are definitely motivated to get their graduation rates up. But I'm going to talk about whether or not the fact that they're graduating actually means that they're learning the content. And that's where I think the big concerns came in. So our research questions were, and I'm actually compiling um, uh, things across multiple studies that we did um, in this presentation. So you know, who are the students that are taking the courses online and how are they interacting with the online course taking system? How do students make academic progress through online course taking? What are the factors in implementation that impede or support quality of learning opportunities? I've hinted at a few of those already. Um, does online course taking for credit recovery increase high school graduation rates and also open up post-secondary education opportunities? So if it helps the students complete high school, then that gives them a chance to, which is often a requirement to take, get into post-secondary education programs. And then do online credit recovery participants earn the same or less than non-participants in the labor market after high school? So I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but the, the concern is that if the students aren't actually learning as well in these courses, what happens later when they leave high school? How, does, how do they perform? How do they do as well? So in the study setting where a lot of this work came from, um, as I mentioned, the online instructional, instructional tool, the course taking system was used not exclusively, but primarily for credit recovery for students falling behind academically. This is important because if you think about this, we're now taking the students who are most likely to be failing, grouping them into classrooms together, mm -hmm. right? And using this, this system for them. Um, so there are equity considerations there. It was implemented in a large high poverty urban school districts during 2010 and 11, that's when we started teaching them. And there were about six to 7,000 student users each year. Um, it, it has been, so eight of the 10 largest school districts in the US have been longtime users of these systems. They tend to be more, um, for example, in this particular district, about 80% of the kids were economically disadvantaged. Um, and so they tend to have already more challenges in their environment for learning. So the idea or the objective for the, uh, the district in using this was to increase course and credit completion. And also, again, what the vendors sell is that, oh, this is going to be great. You can personalize the system for students who perform less well, and then you can even improve their, their achievement through this. Um, by, you know, so we started studying 2010-11 by 2016-17. But 20% of all credits accrued in middle and high schools were through the online course taking system. And 40% of graduate seniors had completed at least one course through the online course taking system. All right, our data analysis period co uh, covered 2010 to 2018. So what did our data look like? So we did the, the particular vendor we partnered, as I mentioned, is in all 50 states. They changed their name not long after some of our research came out. <laughs> and it was some the publications about our findings came out with them. But each, as I mentioned, each student will get a, um, a login. And so we, are, we were able to. So the district is part of when they contracted with the um, vendor. And you know, we, came, we, brought, we got funding to study this. They required the vendor to provide the data to us as part of the contract. And they gave it, they gave it to us at the session level. So we knew every time a student logged in, what they did, you know, how much progress they made, what courses they were working in, how much time they were active or idle in the system, and micro data like that. So over the course of the project, with that was about more than 10 million observations of data. Um, we linked those records to the district records. We also wanted to know. Um, who are those students, right? So remember, we have micro data from the vendor, and we had to link the student level data to those records. And so that also gave us information on, you know, who's, again, who's using the system? Are these students who were struggling already, had suspensions, absences? What were their, what were their reading levels? Um, we could see from their test scores and things like that. Um, and then we did 
hundreds of observations, uh, more than 300 of students taking, um, doing these online courses in 18 high schools where about 90% of all the students took courses online. It was incredibly important. Um, we really saw things that we would have, we would have, would have less, um, we would have learned less in this research if we hadn't done the observations. So for example, I mentioned that the vendor data had a, a, uh, information on percent active and idle time when a student was in a session. Well, we learned that a lot of the, um, that measure of idle time would miss a whole lot of other idle time. The students were very effective at, for example, having a video play while they were watching, let's say a football game on their phone <laughs> and then just clicking to keep, you know, at the right moment to keep it going. We also saw students plugging the headphones into their phone, listening to music and not even hearing the videos. Yes. Did they know they were being monitored in this way? So it was really up to the instructor in the classroom, the extent to which they monitored it. And I think, so some of the students we could clearly see, because we'd sit behind, we could see that if the teacher got up and walked around, they would like, you know, do something on the screen. Um, but there were also some teachers that, you know, had sort of given up on the students. and. Um, one of them that, and, and we did have um, this last point here, we did have structured interviews with the district staff and instructors to understand how they were approaching it. Remember, I still remember one class I went into and um, it was a class, the teacher was a science teacher. Um, there were two students she was working with in front of the class and the rest students were all sitting all around, goofing around and was playing uh, radio and they were talking and chatting and I kind of, they were supposed to be working on their courses. And I asked the teacher after, and she just said she'd just given up. She said, there's only a couple of students who really care. I can't take all my time, you know, trying to mm -hmm. discipline and make them do what they should do. And she'd just given up. So we saw some of that. Um, so I'm not going to go into all the details. I'll take <laughs> questions on it later. And they're also um, pretty detailed in the publications that are referenced at the end. But so one of the things we want to do, we, we use logistic regression initially to predict who is taking online courses. So we had all the student data, right? We could look at who are those users, and we actually created profiles of those of those users to kind of see. You know, we could see some students were really motivated, get in, get it done, and then there were some students, for example, the kind of these topologies that we created. Some students who we learned, you know, we could also uh, look, for example, at their reading levels, right? And there was there was groups of students who their reading levels weren't sufficient for the courses. And not surprising, we saw all those students struggle a lot more to advance um, or get us uh, down. We did um, regression analyses of student course taking behaviors. So for example, um, I mentioned uh, like we knew how fast they were progressing in the course, yes. I just that methodologically. Yeah. So the reading student reading levels wasn't taken into account as a precondition to join the course. So it should be, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't think it was, it wasn't, um, monitored as you, as you would expect. And in fact, the teachers in the classroom would tell us and told us in the interviews, these students don't have the reading levels to it, but you know, if they're in 10th grade and they still haven't mastered, you know, fourth grade reading and they want them to get out of school with a high school diploma, Mm. This was, uh, you'll see why they could do it. Some of them could do it without mastering it. Um, so um, so we looked at their behaviors and how that related to their pass rates on 10 completion, course grades. Um, and courses disabled, a teacher could, if they saw a student just wasn't doing anything or they decided it wasn't right fit, they could disable the course and they would just be done. They then couldn't use it to complete. Um, we did modeling. We used fixed effects regression methods um, and inverse propensity score weighting with regression adjustment to look at how. So it was very important for us to adjust for who is taking those courses, right? And and for um, who uses the course taking system more intensively than others, right? Because we also wanted to look at not just whether or not you ever took a course, but how many courses we were taking. And there were students who we found took courses every single year and not just one. Um, and then we related that to their outcomes, not just these in the system, but also their math and test scores, their grade point average, the credits they earned with the completed high school, and then their high post-secondary um, education enrollment over time. We also used 
to Stasley Schler's instrumental, instrumental variables approach to estimating labor market outcomes. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, that later. And of course, we also did a qualitative analysis of all the observational data that we um, collected. And then we, you know, it was very, we tried to continually, so I'm primarily trained in quantitative methods, but I did a lot of qualitative work as well, because I feel like I am a better quant researcher because I really understand what was happening in the classrooms. Okay, so what are some of the things we learned? Um, so from like, trying to understand who takes these courses online and who doesn't, disproportionate share are students with disabilities, students of color, um, and students, like I said, who are, out, who are falling behind academically. Um, but, it, you know, and this is other research that supports this, right? We also find that these systems are less effective in adapting to students' individual needs. So kind of sold to be adaptive, but they're not very adapted. I mean, we mostly saw that they could adapt, for example, the pace of course taking, you know. Um, relatively low rates of online course completion. This is in the literature, 30 to 55 percent. Um, again, we find the modal approach to personalization of, le uh, of learning is allowing students self-pacing or additional choices for media learning. But we really, and this is in the literature, and we really did not see it allowing innovative instructional practices. So students or instructors really using blended learning effectively. Um, I already mentioned this, as we also saw um, the teachers were mostly trying to manage technology access. And in the system itself, right, the, um, the communication between the students and instructors is asynchronous. And we didn't see very much synchronous intervention by the, by the teacher in the classroom. Okay, this is what we saw. You know, I think pretty much what we um, what I was just describing. There were these lab style classrooms with high student to teacher ratios. And when I say high, I'm talking, I saw them with 70 to one, that high, 45 to one. Um, limited teacher expertise with the course content. And also some of the teachers were thrown in there without even the training for the tech use. So, you know, especially substitute teachers. I saw a substitute teacher come in and say, sorry, can't help you today. I know nothing about this system. You're on your own. <laughs> um, and I mentioned mismatch, mismatches between student reading levels and course content. Now to their credit, when we reported this to the district, what we heard from teachers and what we were seeing, they did, they did change policy. They stopped letting so many um, ninth graders, freshmen starting in to, to start off right away in online courses. A, a serious lack of engagement of stu with student, a student engagement course content. And I can't emphasize that um, um, enough. I mean, in a large lab classroom like that, we might see a couple of, of students who are really working hard to get it done, but a lot of them were just looking at it as an easy way to goof around. And, you know, we saw them not only enduring instructional videos, but we found out that they were often just searching online for the quiz or test answers. Mm -hmm. In fact, initially we would see them like going to Google, but it, we found out over time that there were actually websites where they could pull um, the tests. And actually we're working right now with a teacher in Georgia who was so, Disturbed by this, he started documenting aspects about the assessments, where the answers could be found. And, and so that was the biggest concern. So again, if we're allowing students to pretest and they can just search online for the answers, or, or they can ignore the videos and just find answers online, there's the possibility they're learning nothing. Um, and then um, we also found inadequate language supports. The translation is exactly kind of the opposite of you, as you might imagine. So if you're speaking, let's say you speak a language at home verbally with your parents who maybe it was their native language, but you're not learning to read and write that language in school, right? So if you need something translated, um, the best way would be to have uh, an audio translation. Well, the translation was in like words, right? And so mm -hmm. if they couldn't read it, then, that, you know, it was useless. So we found that the translation was, was the only thing they had. In fact, there's an International Association for K-12 Online Learning. This is what they wrote about it. Um, so online credit programs are low cost, have very low levels of any teacher involvement, require very little students to demonstrate proficiency, used primarily because they're inexpensive, and they allow schools to say students have passed whether they've learned anything or not. So that was an association monitoring pretty much in sync with what we found throughout our study. Um, so here are some, some quotes from interviews. You know, a teacher talking about underclassmen, it doesn't work well. Like I said, the school district did respond to it. Um, and they're pointing out they're not at the reading level required by the program. 
Here's a typical classroom observation, student talking between their phone and a lesson on the screen, texting while lecture play, talking to a student nearby, playing a game on his phone, and then the instructor came by, told him to take notes, but he didn't follow through, right? So some, some supervision, but not much. Um, no, no direct interaction with teachers, students click on the screen, where teacher walks by, otherwise they just stare at the screen and talk to a friend. Um, so we found in our regressions that the percent idle time in a course session was a strong, significant negative predictor course passing rates, on, on time completion, and course grades. And that was just the idle time the system was capturing. We probably saw like three to four times that amount of idle time actually in practice. Um, here, these are the results from the um, propensity score and now where we did the, um, the weighting. And so what you see here, this is a relationship between the years of online course taking in high school and what I call their intermediate academic outcomes. So, um, what we've got if these are credits earned here, the grade point average, math test scores, and reading test scores. The stars indicate a statistically significant result. Everything's below zero, so they're all negative effects, right? So they're just taking one course, you only take one course versus not any, right? Even one course, there's negative impacts on, on grade point average credit. If it's two, you can see grade point average just gets worse. Um, there's three versus zero. And then you can see when they're really using the, the intensively, it really hits their math and reading test scores. Not, we're not terribly surprised um, by this. Um, so, you know, what do we, you have hinted a lot of this already, but what explains these negative associations we see? Yeah. I, again, just methodologically mm -hmm. uh, to understand the system. So you mentioned the test scores. These are the so in class, when they're sitting and no one's supervising mm -hmm. them, these are pre-tests. And then they go, like no, they can't game the actual test. No, no, they do. They do. So the, the pre-tests are all done before they start a mm -hmm. course. Okay. So the pre, so when they're in the classroom, they're taking the course. And, and they can literally pull just about everything they need to answer the multiple choice tests from online. And still their scores come out like, I mean, I'm thinking math scores. So what they can you do can is they, everything. they can, oh, these, oh, these are, I'm sorry, really good clarification. These are standardized test scores separate from the course taking system. Okay. So really important. I forget, this is that US versus other contexts. So all uh, as part of our federal government requirements, all um, students in the US have to take standardized tests to assess their reading and math. It's independent of okay. what's taught in the classroom, what they might learn here. And so the concern here is that they might be passing the courses in the system, but, but this is suggesting the more they use it, the worse they are actually losing compared to other students. And so the important thing about the analysis is that it compares them to students who mm -hmm. were look the same mm -hmm. at the time they started high school, right? One takes more online courses, the other doesn't. Mm -hmm. And then this is their, their yeah, what happens. So compared to those students, they're learning a lot less as yeah. measured by the independent tests. Very Thank important you. clarification. <laughs> I also ask a yeah. question. Mm -hmm. um, so you're saying comparison to other students who didn't take the, the course. Adjusted for selection. Saying... Oh, and, and they're all, we also, very important clarification too. We use a sample of students who failed at least one course. So it means okay. that all these students in the sample failed a course. Yeah. Some had to go back, took it back in the classroom. And Some did it online. Okay. And that's a really important to adjust for selections. Yeah. Yeah. Do you match as well? Yeah, it's uh, all matching. So it's inverse pairs. propensity okay. Okay. Uh, uh, with regression adjustment weighting. So yes, yeah, so we have very rich data, as you yeah. saw, that we're able to use. It's really good. And so we were, yeah, the matching worked really well because one, we have a lot of observations, we get a lot of data about the students and also what mattered to whether or not they took a course online or not. And so, yeah, so unfortunately, <laughs> Um, it doesn't look good. And like I said, there were limited resources that constrained implementation. So the teachers weren't doing much in the way of instructional support. As I tell you about, you know, teachers were supposed to have 20 students on a given day. She has many as 45 and that's 65 students the previous year for mm -hmm. one teacher uh, managing this. Um, here's a person saying, I, I, I'm not a math person. I, I can't really help provide support if someone's struggling in math. And then also I mentioned the, the fact that the substitutes you know, lots of sub higher rate of substitute teachers in online labs. Yeah, it's not 
a desirable classroom for teachers to be in either. Teachers, you know, don't want to be assigned to running these labs. Um, I mentioned also lack of accommodations for students with special needs. Um, yeah, teachers might be aware, right? And we're certainly aware that it was a big demotivator if a student can't even, you know, follow the instruction. Um, and I mentioned about the language accommodations already. Um, students, there were students with um, special educational needs who were also put into this. So, you know, some teachers, frankly, share with us, they described um, the system as a dumping ground for, mm -hmm. for students who weren't doing well. Now, this is interesting. Remember, I said we started, they adopted the system in 2010, 2011 school year. So that's the baseline. And you see what happens over time to um, the four-year uh, cohort graduation rate. That's something that our federal government uses to put everybody comparing graduation rates the same way. You can see graduation rates start going up as use increases and field courses um, start going down a bit in part because again, students are recovering. And what happens is when they recover the credit, it replaces the failure. Mm -hmm. So that's why it looks like fewer failures, right? So they, so, and that's also important to know because that means that when they leave high school and if you were gonna hire st a student or you're gonna evaluate them for post-secondary education, you can't, you don't know whether they completed the course online or in the classroom. You can't make judgments about, about that. So um, now this is looking at what happened to their high school completion post-secondary outcomes. And we broke it up by whether um, students enrolled in one to two online courses in just one or two years. Those are typically the students who find they're short of a credit or two um, before they graduate and go to work. Those enrolled in three or more courses in one to two years. So maybe taking them as upperclassmen but more than um, just one or two courses. And the last one is enrolled in, in online courses in three or more years. That means they've been doing a lot of online mm -hmm. courses. And so you can see that it does have the effect of increasing their high school graduation rates. And these are all again adjusted like we were talking about for, for selection. Um, it, it has a negative effect in enrollment in two and four year colleges just for the group that's intensive users. But as you can see, the, it gets more negative for your college. They're less likely to get into four-year colleges or universities, um, less likely to get into a higher rated institution. Um, no effect on associate degrees if they're trying to get highest degree as like it's a community college, but definitely lower rates of admission to, um, to our typical four-year institutions. And then negative associate with institutions with very high research. So basically this says is that the more intensity you use it, the less likely you're to enroll in a good institution, right? A high quality institution. Um, so now I'm going to shift to talking about the labor market outcomes. So, you know, we have reasons to be concerned. We see in high school that, um, as measured by the standardized test, that they're not, don't seem to be learning as much. There seem to be uh, declines in learning. If they do continue on to post high, uh, post -high school education um, to a college, community college, or college, they're not going to get into the selective a, a college. Um, but what about if they just get the credit and go into the labor market? Because we do know that high school dropouts are at the bottom of the run in the labor market mm -hmm. in terms of like the wages they get and their opportunities. So one possibility is that even if you don't, um, you know, if, or if we, what if, you know, there have been theories thrown out there that kids don't learn much useful stuff in high school anyway, mm -hmm. right? So maybe just the fact that they persisted um, in online coursing and got the degree means that they'll do just fine in the labor market. So, you know, what are the informed by theory? So first is the human capital theory that suggests that if the time spent learning in school really does matter, right, for the ability to do work, then we might expect to see that reflected in their productivity and then the wages that they'll earn eventually. Um, and so there's also what we call sorting models that factor in individual productive differences that are correlated with schooling choices, but not determined by them. So that's why I was just mentioning. So maybe what if you didn't learn much in those online courses, but just the fact that you stuck with it, you didn't drop out of school, you completed the degree, maybe that's a positive, right? Um, for the labor market, you'll you'll show up uh, more often. So, um, and, and that's, it. you know, a lot of employers do make different uh, uh, inferences about, you know, things they can't observe by just looking at, oh, did they get the diploma or not? Um, however, we believe that is once you, if you get hired, 
the workers or the employer should learn more about how productive you are, right? How good you are at the job. Um, and then the value of the high school completion might wane if, if it doesn't reflect your skills. And so one hypothesis is that there's no difference in post high school earnings between high school credit participants and non participants. If you believe that, you know, most important, they get the degree, similar as that they were motivated to complete, and that's good enough. The alternative is that we would expect online credit recovered participants to earn less than non participants in the labor market over time if it really did matter if what they were learning mattered. And the thing is, is like I said, because you can't observe on someone's transcript whether they took the courses online or not. Employers aren't going to have that single signal. Um, so bring them on. And so we might not expect immediately, but you might expect that if they're not performing so well, less likely to get promoted, you know, might move to a worse position, have worse wages or things like that. Yeah. Just a question about signaling. Um, mm -hmm. Could it also have a negative signaling um, rather than a positive signaling? Because I guess taking a course such like that could also... Signal actually, but you can't observe it. They, right. can't, they can't observe it. They don't know. When they're hiring them, they don't know that the students took their courses online. Okay, it's not observable at all. No, nope. they replace the, the grade that they failed is replaced. So they'll never even know that, like, let's say you, you failed an algebra class and you had to take it online to recover it. Mm -hmm. If you cover it in the credit, they replace the fail grade with the new grade, and it doesn't say recovered online. So there's yeah. no signal of yeah. that. Yeah. And is it also um, like not possible for the, the corporations that make these tests to sell the data? Because if you would sell the data, for example, and you have names attached, then you could have a lot of they couldn't Not for like, privacy reasons. Okay, yeah, so we have federal privacy sure. reasons that okay. don't. Yeah, we had to actually, um, you know, it's a lot of work to get approval even to access. Okay. Student. And we we had de-identified data. We had to have them linked. And then, so what we did was we then um, were able to get funding to get date labor market data from um, the Department of Workforce Development to get the earnings linked to the students' school records and all the other data we had. And then we did instrumental um, variables um, analysis, um, which is more complicated. I'll, I'll leave that to the to the readers to follow through. But we were looking at um, it related to course availability and online courses. So uh, whether or not trying to so remember, we're going to look here at a sample where everybody failed at least a course, right? But not everybody took the courses online to get the credits recovered. And so we're looking at um, two different samples here. So, I mean, one of the things I have to adjust for is that um, we don't, uh, we might not observe. So if students, if they're not earning anything, right, we won't observe them. They won't have an earnings record, right? And so we have a constant subsample where these students were able to observe in every single period. So this is 16 quarters out, four years post high school. That's, we could see them every single quarter. And, but this is the full sample. As you can see over time, we, we don't see everybody in, the, in, in work. And so um, two different samples, but you'll see the general results are the same, right? That um, if this is the estimated effect, the standard errors, um, and these are a bunch of tests for our instruments. So you don't have to worry about that. You just look at the effects. So they're increasingly negative, right? So this means that over time, the labor market, those students who recover their courses, course credits on an online course taking system do worse and worse, okay? And for the constant subsample, the effects are even bigger, mm -hmm. right? So some people were losing in the sample over time, but it's also a case that we didn't have um, uh, so because we studied, I remember we studied from 2010 to 2018, some of the students at the end of the sample wouldn't yet have four years of data. So some of it's just also missing. Doesn't mean they all just dropped out of labor market. Some just don't have the data yet. But for the constant subsample, for the group, we did have at least everybody we had four years post. You can see the you know effects are pretty negative. $4,000 a year less that they're earning. And these are pretty much low earners um, already. Um, here you can see it visually. Yeah. Another question. Um, yeah. Is there, so you're comparing those two groups who have all failed at least one course. Mm -hmm. um, 
are there any possible self-selection effects? That... Well, that's what we adjust through for um, the instrumental variables. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's a it's a two stage estimation. Okay. Where you first have to and. I mean, I could give a little tutorial on IV estimation methods, but essentially you're trying to, um, you, you have to have to have an instrument that allows you to remove any endogenous, you know, selection. Mm -hmm. and, and the instrument, that's why these instrument uh, information here is reported because we satisfied those properties of instruments, the metrics that you use to say that, yes, we can say that there's nothing endogenous or selective about mm -hmm. selective differences remain in the sample that would explain away the results. So without a long lecture on instrumental variables methods, you kind of got to trust me, but it's all in great detail in the paper because if you'd use these methods, which are heavily scrutinized, <laughs> right? But I mean, the pattern kind of makes sense, right? Initially, the you'd be hired and you can't tell the difference. We also didn't see that labor market participation differed as much. It was more earnings. So the idea might be that, you know, they miss promotions over time. Mm -hmm. So they don't move up compared to their peers. Um, maybe they get just stuck in a low wage job um, or they may have, you know, periods when they're in and out of work and stuff like that. We still observe earnings. Yeah. So can you tell in the data whether this gap exactly, I mean, there are two possibilities, mm -hmm. broadly speaking, they don't catch up, they don't lose the income, but they enter on a wage and others mm -hmm. progress and they don't or whether they are in and out losing like lose actually yeah. against the starting point the data we have conversations in us about this all the time the data come in the form of what we get is we get their total earnings for a quarter and we get the employer ids so we can see if they had more than one employer which might suggest they switched employers we don't necessarily know for sure that there was a gap Mm. Um, because we don't get it reported in that kind of fine detail. So all I can say that what we know is that there's a slight, uh, slightly lower workforce participation, which suggests to me they're probably churning a bit in the labor mm -hmm. market, but more likely this is coming because they're not moving, they're not advancing. So their peers, they're falling further and further behind in total earnings because, mm -hmm. yeah, but you're right. We're limited, <laughs> a bit limited, uh, and they're all relatively low earners, yes. I'm just wondering if like maternity would have maybe also contributed because it's such a big yeah. difference. And that, so I was wondering if you looked it at- It doesn't, yeah, we looked at differences between uh, males and females and the pattern's the same for males and females. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, because it it's, it's a reasonable thing to think about, right? Yeah, People because I was in the market. But I mean, again, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's something that, uh, I guess theory would predict it, right? If you if you if you graduate, and this is the for the constant subsample. The constant subsample looks like a pretty steady decline, mm -hmm. right? In earnings, and it's just really significant. So I'll do the concluding thoughts, and then we can talk a little bit more about those things. So one of the problems is, is and we were talking about this a little, a little earlier that you know. Are these things here to stay despite, and, and ours is not the only research, it's been pretty consistent in showing that this is not working out very well for students, but it's a, been a really cheap way for them to increase graduation rates. And for school districts that are budget constrained, it's hard for them to let go. So we calculated, we, we drew some early research where um, Hank Levine had looked at different interventions to increase high school graduation rates and price them out. We found that these are about eight to 20, eight to 30 times less expensive than those other interventions to increase if you just want to move the needle on the right, right? Um, and then the other reason school districts value the programs is when students drop out, they lose the state funding associated with that student. So if they can keep them in and get them to, to complete, you know, to keep them in school. Um, I can tell you there was like some really disheartening stuff. And I know we're, we're running low, um, I should all for time for questions, but you know, one teacher, I came in um, to class him early in the year, he had like 45 students. And then at the end of the year, I came back, you tell me how unmanageable it was. He only had 10 students in the classroom. I said, oh, did you get a smaller classroom? Did they recognize it? He said, no, look at my, my roster. He goes, three fourths of the kids aren't here. They stopped attending school. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, right, so we're, we're very concerned about the patterns and the longer term outcomes, right, because in the short term it might be a good fix, but in some sense you might be devaluing um, the high school degree, right, mm -hmm. and, um, and also worry about the equity implications, because if the most disadvantaged students 
are assigned to do this are students with troubles learning. We're really worsening, potentially worsening inequality for them. So one of the things, there's actually a link to research briefs so recognizing that this isn't going away. Created a, a research brief with the Annenberg Institute to say, if you're a teacher in a classroom and you're stuck with this, what can you do to make this work better? Um, but we really think that, you know, whether people need to think about the, these long-term consequences mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and continuing the use of it. And these are just links to the research that this is drawn from. More details on open ethics. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. I'll check whether we have any questions online. Um, okay, let's take the questions online first because I think yeah. we already popped no, have to have a chance. Yeah. That's, uh, but if we have time, maybe we can just come back because I, I feel like there's still so many questions going on. Sure. Okay, um, so from Paula, there's a question What are some of the most important vendors active in this sector? Um, and another question also from Paula, maybe I'll just take those together. Mm -hmm. Aren't there also other hidden factors in students' performance apart from the fact that they took more courses online? How did you minimize, isolate these factors statistically? Yeah, so those, I'll take that question first because I was sort of alluding to that. We did have, uh, you know, one important things about understanding selection, right? Selection into inter intervention like this. And so we worry is that, you know, we didn't maybe pick up everything. There were some things that were unobserved about the students that mm -hmm. really would have affected, you know, how poorly they do later labor market or whether or not they were performing the classes. But we had very rich data on the students. We had their complete records. And so we knew things. Um, and we could, what our methods allow us to do is essentially equate students at the baseline when they're entering high school. So we know, for example, um, you know, where they are in their math and reading performance. What, you know, how often do they attend school? Um, what are, uh, you know, all the other measures we had, like we had ACT scores and things like that. So we have a pretty good way of matching students. Mm -hmm. So the inverse propensity score matching with regression adjustment, kind of doubly robust method to ensure that we are, you know, making sure there aren't unobserved differences. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of, if you, you can read the publications, there's a lot of specific tests we apply to test whether or not they're unobserved. Of course, unless you're experimenting and no one is willing to do an experiment um, on these things, you know, putting kids, I take that back. There was one experiment done, uh, but it was very limited. It was like one class um, algebra in one school um, in Chicago, and they did randomly assign kids to credit recovery and not, it's been, I think that's was a first, and I think there might be a second experiment that's in, still uh, playing out, but they also found negative mm -hmm. effects um, on students. But, and that was just the freshmen who we also did not see were using the system very well. So, and then the other question about the vendors. Yeah. So the vendor market um, is, does have really big companies uh, who have huge kind of market shares. So we studied, like, I think one of the biggest ones that had another, um, at the time it was called Edgenuity, um, and was, I guess, it used in all 50 school districts. It had other uh, competitors. I think Apex was another big name. Um, they, after, it wasn't just our research, but there were other, like, kind of exposés of the use of these systems. And so they were featured in a very prominent publication, and they subsequently changed their name. So, um, and it disavowed all of that and changed their name. But that's actually one of the unfortunate things we've seen is that it's very hard to hold the vendors themselves accountable. Um, and that's, we were talking a little bit about that beforehand, like, you know, what can we do to regulate better? Um, but there has to be a motivation for it too. And, you know, they swept in during the, after the pandemic mm -hmm. and a lot more school districts bought these systems. When we were presenting our work, um, and we're creating this research brief. I interviewed a lot of people and it was just incredible how similar the stories were in terms mm -hmm. of, and I, I had that quote from the International Association, right? That also observed things. And it's it's pretty consistent what we see in use across these big vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that addressed the question very well. Um, Another question uh, from Richard, also addressing the vendors. Um, what can be done by vendors to improve the delivery of their courses? 
are they just transferring real-time pedagogy methodologies online mm -hmm. lectures etc mm -hmm. without being imaginative yeah. about how learning process is different yeah that's a really good question so one of my doctoral students who got engaged in this research she actually for her her thesis went and got a she got a student id and took the courses and documented she created mm -hmm. an instrument to document um you know, both how challenging the content was, whether it was aligned with like, you know, standards the students were expected to meet, like on the standardized test scores, but also looking at things that whether it was culturally responsive. Mm -hmm. And um, so she's published quite a bit of research uh, of her research on that. And the other thing we also were looking at was, um, for example, things like the, the race of the instructor versus the students, right? Whether there's, you know, much variation there. And, and there were a lot of, um, troublesome things that we saw um, in there. Um, for example, some inaccurate or very biased kind of content like a, a history or a citizenship course. In fact, there was a citizenship course that she studied because it was a, a basic course that everybody was, she took, she studied the courses that were most commonly uh, taken by the students. And the vendor acknowledged the problems that were found in it and was going to work with the school district to correct them, but then they just kind of disappeared <laughs> so mm -hmm. and stopped cooperating. But yeah, the, the problem is that the other thing is, is that no one even, unless the teachers themselves went in and took the courses, if you asked someone in the district if they knew what the content was of these courses, they didn't. There were only a couple teachers we found that actually went in and, and, and tried to take the courses to understand, and then also to understand what was missing and to try to supplement it. And one of the teachers I talked to who really cared about his students and was, was doing that said he was getting pressure from the school district because his students weren't moving through the system fast enough <laughs> because he was taking the time to, 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 actually like, help them. to try and help them really <laughs> learn it and supplementing, taking the time to understand what was in the system and supplement it with his own materials when he found it inadequate. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a big, that's the other big concern that you mentioned about regulation. Yeah. Who's looking at this? And that was a concern for us. Who's who's actually developing those courses, the vendors entirely? Hmm. That's pretty shocking. And, yeah. Um, and the measurement of success. That it's like, the metrics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So we found maybe or very little bit of kind of higher order uh, thinking challenges for students. And someone asked about like, so I, I was watching like, a biology and the teacher the instructional video is trying to show you know to get the students to act as if they're in a lab right well they'll get a little measuring tool and they're supposed to like measure like the amount of liquid or something but it's not yeah. it's never the same as hands-on mm -hmm. and, and we only talked to one student who was 18 because we weren't you know allowed to talk to the, we could observe the students but we weren't supposed to be unless they offered us but one student she came up she said I'm 18 I'm gonna tell you she said I had classes all four years online and she said, I missed, I didn't have discussions with my peers. I missed interaction. I didn't, you know, I missed all the hands-on ways of learning. And she said, I, I really regret what I experienced. So. Yeah. Um, we are running, we have three minutes left. Mm -hmm. So I think we can take one more question. Is there any more online or no? Uh, only I think we're pretty good. Okay. But if anyone here wants to ask a question, this is a good time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm, I also have a public policy background and I'm just yeah. wondering, what are your proposals? Because changing graduation as a goal, mm -hmm. well, I don't know. Like yeah. you got to put the people quickly yeah. into the system, but and, or like offering more funding yeah we've heard that like what are the the ideas yeah. how to tackle that yeah so one of the things it's a really good question because it, the this the district that we partnered with for a very long time it wasn't that they were just saying oh we don't care <laughs> you know they did care um but it was the amount of re additional resources that they would have needed to send the system away and not use it just weren't existing, they're actually getting less and less. So um, one of the things, of course, is we could use more federal funding. And I would also say um, we should. So for example, these, it shouldn't be up to a district to have to um, like observe and regulate the content but because it's used nationwide and these, these vendors have wide access. Um, it should be a federal, there should be federal 
examination of, hmm. you know, what is in these courses, how they're being used and could, prov could provide guidance and could also, like you mentioned, we're not going to say no to high school graduation rates as a performance measure, but maybe they could take a look at how much students are using, um, how, how, you know, even if you could start marking in their records, right, the online course taking or that data could be shared, you could look at how much of, of the students learning happened online through these systems versus provided by the district, right? And that alone might allow them to look more broadly, right, across the nation of what are the relationship between this and look also maybe start thinking about should you have standards or expectations for, for example, student teacher ratios in a classroom where this is being done or content knowledge, right? So one of the things we talked about with the school district was what if you if you determine which of the students are repeating the courses that are math oriented and make sure you have a math or more than one math <laughs> teacher in the room to make sure that you can address the content oriented questions. Um, so I think there's a whole lot that can be done. And our research brief provided some like directive or suggestions um, based on what we saw for that. But yeah, I think the idea that is this gonna go away, especially since COVID increased um, the number of students using these systems is, is probably, we have to reckon with it and better to start doing something about you know, those potentially negative consequences. Great, thank you so much yeah. for this really interesting presentation. I feel like I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. um, thank everyone else for coming here and online. Um, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.